Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 14, Interface Description Languages. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so my uh, Twitter and Facebook account got hijacked. No! It was not good times. Yeah, so I spent a significant amount of time today cleaning up, uh, you know, tweets and posts that I didn't make. And, uh, but they're archived you know. forever somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now, uh, con- coincidentally, uh, Facebook is uh, sending me ads for Russian models. Not just <laughs> oh, no. But, uh, uh, so was it better or worse than losing a wallet? Or have you ever lost a wallet before? Now I've never lost a wallet. I did lose my keys, but I lost them actually in, in the bottom of a lake. So I've kind of figured that they weren't coming back and no one was finding them. So but, one day somebody will drive away with your car after finding keys in the bottom of a lake. <laughs> yeah, especially now. Well, uh, but uh, but yeah, basically, um, you know, we talked about KeyPass, which is an awesome program. Highly recommend, especially now. Highly recommend everyone use it. Um, but I, I wasn't using KeyPass, you know, for a while, especially before the show. And uh, so I had like a default password that I used for things that I didn't really care about, like Twitter tisk, and tisk, Facebook. Tisk. Yeah, and it was just, it wasn't, it was just completely alpha characters. It wasn't a, you know, numeric or anything. And plus I used the same password for like basically everything I didn't care about. Like anytime I had to sign up for anything. And so invariably, you know, somebody you know didn't store my password securely and uh you know got leaked out and associated my email and everything and so somebody just went through and systematically logged into everything that they could get into with that password um and the so way it turned I've, out you were in europe asking for money after being kidnapped yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so i uh the way i found out was kind of interesting i got an email from facebook saying someone uh with an ip address they traced to japan um, try, you know, logged in successfully as me to Facebook. And so that kind of tipped me off. And so uh, then I went and sure enough, there were all these tweets on Twitter and Facebook posts that I didn't make and I had to clean all that up. Oh, man. Did anybody else let you know? Like, did any of your friends see what was going on? Oh, no. So interestingly, this all happened really quickly. So basically, um, you know, all the tweets started, I would say, like eight hours before I found out. Um, so, uh, you know, the person like hadn't had enough time for it really to propagate to any of my friends mm. or anything like that. And the Facebook posts were even more recent than that. Um, so they didn't change your password though. Cause that would have been bad because the recovery for your password would have been your email, which you then also didn't have access to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. This could have been a disaster. Actually, it's, uh, interesting you mentioned that because, uh, my coworkers, uncle's, uh, Yahoo account got hacked, hijacked. And they actually changed the, uh, you know, forgot password, like the backup email. They mm-hmm. changed that to an email that they owned, like the hijackers. Right. And they changed the security questions and yeah, <laughs> depending yeah, on how, exactly. and depending on the specifics of the system. But yep. yeah, it can be really bad. Yeah. So actually they do have, um, so fortunately my Gmail account was not hacked because it uses a completely different password. Um, but they do have like a lot of these websites like Facebook and Google have what's called two-factor authentication. And the way this works is you um, you have a program running on your phone. And basically, whenever you have to put in your password to log into, let's say, Gmail, you also have to go on your phone and you hit a button. And the button gives you a six-digit number that you type in along with your password. And so the idea is for someone to hijack your account, they not only have to have you know your password, but they also have to have your phone. Yeah. So that adds another layer of uh, security. Yeah, and Google's I think actually will they have an option to either text you or call you if you don't have a smartphone. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, because I have it set up to call me. I don't. I don't remember why I did that. This is kind of <laughs> oh, weird. Nice. If I try to log in, I get a, my phone will start ringing. I'm like, why is it ringing? Oh wait, I, oh that's why. And then it's coming up on screen like you know enter your your I think what they call it, OTP. Yeah, one-time, one-time password. password. Yeah. So so the fu- so you actually get a call from Google and they it just says like well, it just three, has some random six, number four, and then you pick up it's like this is your Google verification code and then they say it once and then they repeat it. 
That's pretty cool. And, and it ends. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And I assume texting is probably similar. Just text you a six-digit number. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And so. So yeah, I might set up uh, two-factor authentication um, on things I really care about, so that you know, worst case, if something like this happens and someone gets my password, at least I'm still safe somewhat. Yeah, the only hassle is, and I guess this may be a different controversial subject. Well, maybe not controversial, I don't know. But if you, like, uh, your wife needs access to your email ever. So it was the case where uh, I think we had been communicating with our bank or with somebody, and they had only been using my email for some reason. And my wife needed, like, I needed her to print off some documents. She was at home and I was at work. And so she needed to get on my email. And she knows my password, but she didn't know my you know, she couldn't have this, this code. And so she had to like, like I had to get the phone call, write the number down and then call her and give her the number. Um, oh, so I nice. guess that's really safe, but you know, it was kind of awkward that like, I wanted her to be able to have access, but in this way it was actually difficult to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Oh man. In yeah, hindsight, I see, what I should I have done is actually just disaster. for forward it to her. But, uh, I guess this is controversial as well, but you know, it's like, you worry about uh, it's okay for me to do two-step authentication and I want to be really safe and have secure passwords and I inc you know try to educate other people the same way but you know you don't always know and so there's this hesitancy to like you know I don't know you don't know what other people's passwords are you don't know if they're good you know so you don't want to forward something to somebody who might have a that may be very personal to you or have you know private information and then they don't have security like you would want yeah yeah totally so, so actually this so the the big thing to take away from here folks at home is uh you know because i'm pretty sure that what happened was you know i put my password in on some forum and somebody wasn't you know wasn't hashing the passwords and it just totally got leaked out and i think even major websites like joystick.com had this whole thing where all of the passwords got leaked out like in plain text um so if you're going to, you know, have a password which um, you don't really care about, like if you need throwaway passwords, use KeePass. Um, just to recap what it does, um, you have this master password. You put it in and it opens up a program with just a list of passwords. And it can auto-generate passwords. You can type in passwords. You can just, you know, make up all passwords on the fly. It's sort of like writing your passwords down on like a sheet of paper for the ones you don't care about. But, uh, but that sheet of paper is now protected. You know, it's better than just having it, you know, taped uh, attached to your monitor or something like that. So. You know, although I've actually heard somebody make an argument that it's better to write passwords like that down. Um, so at least you guarantee they're different and you don't aren't encouraged to use the same one over and over again. Better to do that than... Than use the same password that's easy or the same. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just because that way you can remember it. Yeah. I mean, but then, of course, you... if somebody breaks into your house, they have all your accounts. Yeah, that's true. But if you, um, if someone breaks into your account, if into your house, you probably should just change everything. <laughs> like, yeah, that's jo true. Join the witness protection program. But uh, if, if, um, yeah, whether you write them down yourself or whether you use a program like KeePass, use a different password for every website that you don't care about. Because chances are, if you don't care about it, you know, it's probably they're not pro probably not doing a good job securing your password. So, don't be like me. Don't get all your things you don't care about hijacked <laughs> and the bad thing is you know since i use the same password for everything i don't care about then basically like all of those things now can be compromised i mean like you know by their yeah. nature i don't care about any of them but still i don't like the idea that someone's going on like the name arcade forums <laughs> masquerading as me or whatever you know although i guess that's maybe the least bad thing but yeah it's still kind of bad yeah 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 so it's kind of a catch-22 it's like if i cared enough I, I would have put a real password, but then at the same time, like, I don't want somebody to, like, Well, it's hard, too, because, like, each me. individual one you might not have cared enough about. But now that, like you said, somebody can masquerade as you on many things, that's actually more annoying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, all right, cool. for the first news story, I had one in here about, and we talked about this a little bit before, about next generation console, consoles uh, having this, uh, you know, much more kind of a Valve type system where... Things are more downloaded, and you you put in pass or you put in unique keys, and that key is tied to your console or your group, like your login, and so you can't uh, you know just have normal CDs and stuff. And yep. I just read an article about this is interesting. So um, Sony has a storied past with hacker community, and yeah. um, 
the new their new handheld game system i think it was a new handheld on the psp vita um has this ability to go online and download games right like yay they're a little bit cheaper and you can go online you don't have to go to the store and they saw it as this wonderful thing well so of course uh just like uh people without a lot of scruples do on many different devices they essentially wrote a hack to get around this using an exploit in i think a combination of the game and the os um, so one of the games that allowed you to kind of undo the DRM, the digital rights management that prevents you from running games, which you don't have the key for. And so uh. um, th- th- that might be a great oversimplification. But anyway, so what uh, Sony did was because they have this power that it's all online, they, you know, pulled those games down and then, you know, tried to patch it and put them back up again and then upgrade the flaw that was exploited in the operating system as well and then force everybody to upgrade immediately so the thing that's kind of interesting is that had this been normal you know whatever generation or two ago uh, a little less so with the current generation but still still could be done i guess is you have cds made or dvds made and you can't like remake those dvds somebody will always have that dvd with that exploit on it and the only thing you can do is force people to upgrade their the firmware running on their devices but this is even faster because they could pull it from the store and change it force everybody to update both their game and their os to be able to access anything online and essentially kind of stop it in its tracks. Yeah, right, right. So that's pretty cool. So, so, so it sounds like, well, can't you? You can always just not upgrade, right? Or no? Well, so the way they do it, though, and this is interesting, is that I, so I, I, you know, this is outside of the story now. So this is Patrick pontificating. Um, okay. But yeah, so the I mean, the, the issue is, ooh, I like it. Um, <laughs> The issue is that if you have this kind of online connectivity as like a base feature, so you're downloading games from the store, you're up, you know, there's all this digital rights management on your stuff as opposed to a disc, you would say like, oh yeah, just don't update. Well, the problem is they can force you to, right? Because the game, like Valve has this, you can not be connected to the internet and play your Steam games, but only for a set amount of time or a set amount of plays, I don't remember. And then if you haven't connected the internet, it won't let you play until you do connect to the internet. And then as soon as you connect to the internet, first thing they're going to do is, in order to play your game, you have to update because Steam's out of date. And then once you update, boom, gone. Like you, like uh, you lost what it was. So I assume the PlayStation Vita can do the same thing. Like they can, if you go to play your game, they'll say, "Oh, you haven't connected online in a month. Like you need to connect online." Or if you try to go online to play with your friends, you know, then they'll do the same thing because it's all through their system. Oh, I see. It's, it kind of reminds me of, and this is now Jason pontificating because I have no idea how this <laughs> technology actually works, but. Um, you know how, remember how they used to have those like zips with the password on the zip? Yes. Like, yeah, you'd, you'd go to unzip it and be like, oh, nope, sorry, you need some password that's, you right. know, hashed into the zip, otherwise you can't get the contents. Like, it's probably something like that, but with a, with a temporal component to it, you know? Like, it's some kind of like zip hash thing, but it, but it's based on the current week, let's say. And so once the week expires, like, you don't have the password anymore kind of thing, and you have to go and you know get it from sony and sony will only give it to you if you know you haven't been compromised or whatever so yeah it's just tied to your account like yeah i think you're right so like it requires some some piece that exists in the operating system to basically unlock it and that piece of the operating system would be very hard for a hacker to write and so without it the game just says like hey I, i i'm calling this and it's not coming back like what's going on Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you can make it to where the server has to be involved, it's basically like hacking that would be the same as like hacking your bank password or something like that, you know, because you have to send some authentication out and then it has to get, you know, accepted on on the other end and then sent back to you. I mean, that's really the same as logging into a website. So, I mean, that that security has been around forever. Right. Yeah, I mean, we could guess all day, but I guess exactly how it's done. But it's just, to me, it was an interesting fact that this... As everything moves to online, the ability for them to take control out of your hands comes in. I, it's reminded of the, uh, was it Amazon who pulled a version of 1982 or 84, wait, which is the one? I oh, yeah, 1984, well. the George Thank Orwell. Yeah. George Orwell. Wow, I said 1982 is like our birthdays or something, right? Uh, Birth years. No, not mine, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, okay, confusion. But they had somebody had published <laughs> a version of that book that wasn't authorized. And then people had, I think it was free or people had paid a little and then amazon found out and they actually not just stopped selling it they went and took it away from everybody's device right right i remember that story 
which is yeah, kind of like, was, whoa, 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 hang on. Yeah, basically, it's like the book was not in public domain, but like it was under some, you could publish it for free, but it wasn't public domain. There was some license and like Amazon, like didn't agree with the license or whatever, something like that. Yes. So yes, George Orwell. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, basically like, yeah, I mean, Steam and, and, you know, it's, it makes me wonder if, if the whole like piracy hacking thing is going to just go away. Like for example, you know, now so many things are online. The really, the only thing that's going to be left to hack is like your OS or something like that. I mean, I, no, I, just, I mean, well, uh, okay. We're using the term hacker here kind of doubly. I, I like there's I a meant, hacker, of, like hacker pirate. website. What happened to Jason? Yeah. And then there are likely happened to Jason. And then there's hacking like we're kind of talking about here, which is more like subversion. Well, that's a, a, another thing. But, you know, like <laughs> you're doing something that the manufacturer doesn't want you to do, but it's not necessarily illegal or, you know, attacking somebody else. Right, right. I, I guess I meant to say piracy when I said hacking. Yeah. So uh, the problem is there are legitimate reasons why you would want to do some of these things. You bought the hardware. Like at some level, you should have the rights to run what you want. So like what if you just want to write run custom games? So I saw this band the other day that was uh, playing chip tunes, which is like, you know, retro style game music. Um, and they used a Game Boy. So somebody had like designed a cartridge that you put in that is basically like a what are those things called? A sequencer that, oh, yeah. you know, you could play you know these tunes with on this game boy well I, i'm pretty sure that's not an official game boy cartridge <laughs> yeah. so like but you know game boys how old and those people owned it they weren't taking any money from nintendo that i'm aware of you know like why should they not be allowed to make music on their game boys with this special game boy cartridge you know and at that level like i want to support them but the problem is that's a in my mind that's a small percentage of the people most people do these kinds of hacking to do piracy right right so yeah, it's yeah. a hard line to walk. I mean, Google made that uh, Google Maps for Nintendo, the NES Maps. Oh, yeah, the April Fool's joke? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'm pretty yeah. sure Nintendo didn't expect that when they released the NES. No, maybe not. Yeah. Well, so, talking um, about cool hardware, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll segue in here to a second story, not to kind of take over from you and not give you any stories, but this oh, story no, is really cool. So there's this website. I don't know if we talked about it before, Kickstarter. So it's kickstarter.com. And the way it, this basically works is you pledge money to projects. And then those if they reach a certain goal level of funding, then your money gets collected. If not, then, um, you know, you just keep your money. Nothing, nothing transpires. And so people post up ideas they have for projects. They collect funding. And then as part of it, like if they can set levels of funding. And if you pledge that level, they agree to give you, you know, products or you know, merchandise, or if they're making a movie, send you a copy of the movie on DVD or maybe just online or whatever. But it's gotten a lot of attention recently with uh, a bunch of video games, you know, going over a million dollars. I think there's like three or four video games now that have gone over a million dollars in funding mm -hmm. for, uh, for the most part, games that don't have a lot of, nobody knows what they're going to be. It's just going to be, so is it Tim Schafer from Double yeah, Fine Games? Right. You know, he, he made a bunch of cool games, uh, what, Full Throttle, Grim Fandango, some yep. other ones. And he doesn't even know what game he's going to make. He's just like, it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be like those. And people are like, oh, yeah, here's millions of dollars. And yeah, it's it was insane. Really, it was just, really it exciting. It just blows my mind. I mean, we need to, like, jump on this or something. Uh, yeah, maybe we should uh, crowdfund uh, Programming Throwdown the Movie. <laughs> Starring Jason Gauchy. <laughs> as the fake Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. <laughs> Oh you know what's God. cooler than oh no we won't start quoting movies from the social network oh, anyways it's cold <laughs> oh no never mind <laughs> all right anyway, so uh th th i wanted to talk about this thing that i thought was really cool on here that has now raised five point almost seven million dollars as the time of this recording and i say time of this recording because it's going up like a rocket i think it broke a million dollars in a little over one day of being on here um wow. and it's a e-paper watch for smartphones so it looks pretty cool. A number of companies, I guess, have tried to do this before. So what is Apple, it? So Apple kind of did this with like the iPod Nano watch band thing or I don't know. So what it is is a watch that you wear on your wrist and it's made, the display is e-paper. So it's just black and white, but it's, you know, sunlight readable. It's nice and, and it gives it, I guess, a longer battery life. Um, and so it normally just displays the time, but you pair it to your iPhone or your Android phone. And if you get a text message, um, it'll display like the, a summary of the text on your watch. And has a little vibrating motor to signify you you got an alert. You can ah. sync it. They have another one that shows like a, using it like a pedometer 
or showing a distance that you've run like while you're running um, because I don't know if you've ever tried to run with a GPS tracker on your phone. It's actually kind of nice because it tells you distance and it tells awesome. you speed. But it's annoying to look at your phone while you're running, especially if you have it like strapped to your arm or something. Oh, so that's yeah, really right. cool. Um, you know, and it can display different watch faces so you can customize it. And they're, they wrote like an SDK that they're going to release for everybody to be able to write against so people can write apps. And they showed a demo where you kind of just run the uh, program on your phone and then you go to like their app store and... I, they don't really talk about it, but I assume you'd be able to buy, or hopefully a lot of them will be free. You bu- you know buy new apps for your watch through your phone. That's totally awesome, man. So that is really cool. Um, it it's hard because you're laying out the cheapest one you can get right now is for a black one. It's hundred and fifteen dollars. I'm not a big watch person, so to me that's kind of a lot for a watch. Um, and you don't get it until September. Ooh, so that's rough. And, uh, the only ones they have right now, I think, are all prototypes. So you're kind of banking on like that it'll be really awesome in that time. Like you, can't, it's not normal because normally you go on Amazon or wherever, look for reviews, but there are no reviews because it doesn't really exist yet. It's just it's wild that they raise so much money. I mean, I'm looking at it and like I'm literally I'm hitting refresh, and every time I hit refresh, they're raising thousands of dollars. Like, oh, you're right. It's like it went up by ten thousand dollars in just since I'd had it loaded before. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, like the amount of power behind Kickstarter is just phenomenal. I mean, I, I've just never really seen anything like it. Like the news stories, everyone that I see just blows my mind when you think about just the sheer volume of money that they bring in for these well, projects. So imagine if you're a backer of this, uh, forget kickstarting the projects. I wish I had kickstarted Kickstarter. <laughs> Cause like, I mean, they get a cut of all this money. So do like, they really, that's you know, yeah. Ask. In the last couple of months, I, I mean, I think there's been over probably $15 million. I would guess very conservatively has gone through there. So whatever their percentage of that is, it's gotta be huge. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's just so, so insane. It is real. I, I mean, it really is one of those things where, in my opinion, I might offend people, or, or maybe I don't know the whole story. There's nothing revolutionary about the technical background for doing this. Like, this idea had been there. Yeah, it, totally. The, it didn't need like a new technology or awesome programming or whatever. But it's just a really, really good idea, and it hit at the right time, so it got traction. It wasn't ahead of its time, so everybody jumped behind it, and now it's like taking off. I'm really curious at like what the average project percent is, you know, like the average product, how fully funded is it? Because, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Like I'm looking at saw, these, a lot um, of them seem like pretty well funded. Yeah. There's a couple other websites that have started to spring up, which do that kind of like they'll graph over time, how much the project's been funded and things like this. And there are a lot of projects I've seen, which get like almost no money. Like they, are just kind of like what somebody because i think their standards like you have to get them vetted i think like you have they have to approve your project mm-hmm. but then a lot of that them are kind of like that's kind of silly or stupid and then nobody ever gives any money to it or like uh, they I raise see. 15 dollars or something yeah yeah hmm, but it's awesome because it's a way for the project makers to gauge demand before they make something but as a consumer i'm kind of worried because you're buying something you have no idea what it's going to be like so even if they like let's assume something bad doesn't happen and they don't go under and not deliver you anything in which case i'm not sure where you're at because your money's gone they can't like they spent it and then they got hit by a disaster like i don't i don't know what happens in that case oh i Um, thought that i thought that the whole point was that they don't take the money from you until like no they take the money when the funding ends oh but not when they deliver something oh wow see I, i was under the impression that basically both parties would have to agree like so for in other words for this watch thing you know if they say that for 120 dollars you'll get a prototype of a watch then like you lose the money when you get the watch you know what i mean no 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 no. you lose the money when like on this one may 18th i guess um they'll take the money from your account and then in september this company promises that they'll ship you something that's going to be awesome right but they don't have to I don't, so I don't know legally, they maybe have some obligation, like, but I don't know what Kickstarter's involvement would be if that happened. Like on this one, they'd probably want to get involved because it would be very drastic. Right. But like, you know, if you fund something smaller or whatever, I don't, like they could deliver it to you, but what if it just sucks? Or like, what if it only lasts an hour instead of, you know, a week, like they say it's going to, um, on a battery charge? What, I mean, what, what are you to do about it? Like I said, you can't go online and read reviews first. It's not actually made. They're getting money so they can design it and make it and build it. It's It sounds like kind of like crowdsourced angel investing, you know? I mean, it's basically what it is. 
Except yeah. the only thing is, you know, an angel investor expects to get like a huge return. In this case, you're expecting you get, to get the watch before yeah. everyone else. I don't know. Which yeah. I guess is a huge return because like if there's some people who really like, it's like, oh yeah, I got the watch before everyone. It's so cool. You know what I mean? So I have kickstarted one or two things, um, a board game that was kind of cool. And I think maybe one other thing for like, but it was much less money. I think it was like $20 or something. Yeah. Right. Um, and it was a company that had done a Kickstarter before and delivered well on it. So I had a little bit more confidence. Oh, um, is there like a feedback loop? Like uh, they, well, they... you can look it up, right? Like you can just Google the people or I think it tells you like how many, t- how many projects they've like done. Oh, gotcha. Um, but you could just like Google the company, Google the name and, you know, look for news stories. or That's how I did it anyways. Um, okay. But I'm hesitant. My, my philosophy on this one has become like they're saying in here, it'll, I think they said it'll retail for 150 so my thing is for my extra $35, I kind of rather wait and just buy it when it actually comes out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, for I mean, if you put your money in like a CD or something, actually, I take uh, that back. No, no, you'd have to get really, if you have something that's that secure, let me know. <laughs> you used to be able to make like 8% on a CD, but that was probably like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, interesting. Oh, man. That's so you cool, have, though. You have the next news article. Yeah, so so this is a uh, pretty fun. It's Pac-Man running on the on a JavaScript implementation of the, or I guess emulator of the Zero X10C CPU. So okay, you said a bunch of words that I have no clue that anybody's gonna know what <laughs> yeah, you're talking so about. Yeah, so let's take a step back. So um, Minecraft, the creator of Minecraft, Notch, they're making a, he's making a space game, and I think you've done some research on this, but I'll go into a little bit. There's um there's a 0x10c CPU, which is this virtual hardware that you can control on your spaceship in this new space game that's coming out. So, so the I, I don't have much more other than the game. I guess is just I, I assume you pronounce it OX10 to the C. I don't know. Um, yeah. And the, it's a space game, and in that space game, you have a spaceship which has a fixed power supply generator of so many watts. Um, and you like mine something, I guess, from like an asteroid or a moon. It, the details are kind of scarce right now. But on your ship, while you can use the CPU, which has a fixed number of speed and cycles and all this, you know, you can use it to like guide the ship. But if you're just sitting there waiting for like some processing background tasks to run, you can play games on it. And instead of like making games himself, like little mini games, he released a specification for the processor, this the DCPU 16. And people are now already starting to write application and games to run on this imaginary, well, real in-game spaceship CPU. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is totally awesome. You know, this this actually, this is, I think, reaching the apex of something that has sort of really been brewing. I mean, you know, Notch is, himself has even admitted he's very influenced by Dwarf Fortress, which is a game released by Tarn Adams. Um, so you can actually download and play for free. And Dwarf Fortress is like a text-based version of Minecraft, believe it or not. Um, kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's actually there's actually even more going on in Dwarf Fortress because you control like many different people instead of uh, like a first-person mode. Um, but it's it's one of these games. It's very abstract, like very hard to visualize because it's literally ASCII art, and you're only looking at one sort of slice of the world. So in other words, like if you if you have a mountain you're looking at one slice of the mountain so you see this like ring of m letters or something right and as you use like the brackets to go up and down in in the z levels basically the circle of m's gets smaller and like you just have to sort of in your head visualize yourself as like moving up through these like little slices of this mountain right so it's one of these really abstract games but but it had a lot of the fluid dynamics and things that you see in minecraft um and one of the things that people did early on in Dwarf Fortress is actually make computers. And one person went so far as to make a Turing machine in Dwarf Fortress. And so for people who don't know, a Turing machine is, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's basically <laughs> the universal computational machine. So the idea is if you can uh, make a Turing machine, then a, a Turing machine can, can compute any problem or any algorithm. That's computable. That's computable, right. So anyway, there's a lot of theory stuff that we probably shouldn't get into now, but basically, you know, people were really into 
doing like computation in Dwarf Fortress and and uh, that really you know someone wrote a 10 bit adder and all this stuff so um, and people have done that in Minecraft too somebody wrote like an adder with sheep or something like that's bizarre somebody wrote a graphical calculator I saw a video of so like you can actually stand on buttons enter a, like an equation or whatever and then it'll like plot it out on a screen in game like a giant yeah. all these blocks that make up a computer screen it's crazy yeah it's totally amazing right so um so notch is just taking it to the next level by saying all right you guys i'm going to just give you straight up a computer with assembly instructions and everything and just the point of the game is to do fun things with this computer or or also really effective things like coming up with a clever AI to mine asteroids and things like that. And it's really, the interesting thing for me is, you know, I have a coworker, a guy who sits a couple rows from me, and he's constantly working on, like, scripting MMOs. So he wrote a bunch of, like, bots for World of Warcraft, and uh, he wrote uh, <clears throat> a bot for, uh, what is it, the Star Wars? Star Wars Knights of the Republic or something like oh, that. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he actually wrote a bot that, like, looks at the memory and then, you know, moves around and it can farm gold on its own and stuff Knight, like that. Knights of the Old Republic? Is that... No, that's a that's, that's a single player. Yeah, this is... They oh, made okay. an MMO. I might be getting the name wrong, but it's a Star <laughs> Wars MMO. But so... so oh, yeah, just the Old Republic. Yeah, so, so he wrote, uh, you know, an, basically an AI, a bot, to play that game or to grind that game. Um... And so it's just interesting for Notch to come out with this game and say, look, you know, the point of the game is to write the bot to play the game. <laughs> you know, it's uh. sort of, it's so meta. I love it. So. Oh, that was RoboCode. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yes. Sorry, RoboCode is totally awesome. So, okay. RoboCode, you, you were talking about writing the bot to play the game. That is literally what RoboCode was. It was a, a tanks that were in an arena and you had like a, a version, like a special set of Java that you could write that would say what the tank should do. Like, the tank should scan its radar, and if it sees somebody, it should do this. And if it's this far away, it should behave like this, and it should rotate left and move forward. And you could just kind of program AI or something that just ran around and shoot randomly. Like, you know, you could just program all sorts of things, and then they would put them in giant tournaments. The Sorry, they. The online system, you could play on your computer tournaments, but you could also submit it online to run your code, and they would run online tournaments Yep. where they would pit everybody's different ones against each other and see whose was best. Yeah, you know, this this has come up a lot, this kind of thing. And the funny thing is it's always, like, the really stupid, stupid simple algorithm that wins. Like, like they had this, uh, what was it called again? Robo... Robocode? Robocode, yeah. They had this Robocode. And they were, you know, you have all these aspirations. Like, oh, someone's going to write some crazy genetic algorithm, neural network thing, and it's just going to, like, have this crazy AI. It's going to do all this awesome stuff. And no, it's like the guy who writes the code, it says, like, turn left and shoot, like, wins. You know? <laughs> and uh, then they had this with Mario, too. Somebody made an open source clone of Mario, and they said, write an AI to play Mario. Um, and sure enough, the guy had this AI where basically he did uh, a Minimax, which is an algorithm that they use for, like, playing checkers that's been around for, like, 50 years. Um, and he beat everybody with, like, neural networks and everything. Like, this guy who wrote this algorithm that was discovered you know 50 years ago just like just wins and they had uh, something else where it was like this like open source uh it was like this uh open-ended world where you know you had this like population it was like this cellular automata kind of thing so there's a bunch of cells with people in them and uh you could like move forward you could turn you could mate and you could like kill like these are the four things you could do and so, like, people wrote all these genetic algorithms. They were trying to see if they could get, like, a group, like a wolf pack kind of thing to evolve. And, you know, the person who won, basically, it's like, turn left, try to have sex, and kill. <laughs> like that. Like, and he beat all the neural networks and everything. <laughs> and it's just, like, one thing after another. It's, like, it's like uh, always seems to be, like, these really simple algorithms take over, which is really sad for AI people like us. Yeah, well, that's the, like... Uh um, game theory thing, right? That basically they did this thing where you could uh, re what is it? Oh, I'm gonna mess it up. Iterative prisoner's dilemma. Yeah, that's There's right. It's a basic one, and everybody wrote all these algorithms to say like, oh, if we play over and over again this game with a choice, like what should you do based on what the other person does? And people came up with all these complex things like, if he's doing this two times in a row, then do the opposite constantly. And it turned out the one that won was just tit for tat, like just do 
whatever the other person did last time, do next time. Yep. Yep. So it's kind of sad, but but you know, I think it's a little humbling too. So sometimes AI people we need to eat a slice of humble pie. I guess that's why you just stay out of AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kids at home, don't go into AI. It just makes you sad. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. AI is uh, great. Talking um, about uh, computer research. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you're going to go into AI, apparently you shouldn't go into it at UF right now. <laughs> the University of Florida, uh, for those of us, we probably shouldn't shorten too much. So Jason and I are both from the state of Florida. Right. But Jason, you didn't go to the University of Florida. You went to... Central Florida. University of Central Florida. But I went to the University of Florida. So I guess this story has some sort of importance to me as UF is my alma mater. Mm -hmm. Um, And the computer science department is facing budget cuts. And I guess they're going to try to uh, put it under the electrical and computer engineering department. But this is controversial for a number of reasons, including like a bunch of researchers and teachers potentially will lose their job. Um, But we we want to take this opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about – so the story – to some people we were talking, I was talking to, and this is a little nuanced, right? Like, well, why does it matter? The program's not actually going away. It's just gonna be in another department. Like, what does that really matter? And it led to this discussion about just all the different computer science degrees there are and how it varies school to school. Right. So, yeah, so I mean, what was your degree, what was your undergraduate degree in, Jason? Yeah, so my undergrad was in computer science. And uh, it was kind of tough for me because 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 UCF as well as UF they have computer actually I don't even know UF probably has even more than this but at UCF there was computer science there was computer engineering and there was electrical engineering which had some programming in it and then there was also management information systems <laughs> which had programming like and a lot of computer science prerequisites but was like a different program yeah it was more for like people who were doing business right like in the was it in the business school or um no actually so it was more geared towards it okay Okay. yeah yeah, so it was a lot more about like networking servers that kind of thing yeah so all of those people take a very similar course load but they are different uf has the same but i yeah well at least we used to have more so you had you could do a digital arts and sciences which is like for people in art but want to do programming as well like programming for 3d renderers or you mm-hmm. know people doing it so we had that we had one that was in the business school that was for people who wanted to be able to do like sql queries and scripting and also be able to be business people and do more analysis and stuff um then we had computer science which was a liberal arts degree we had computer science in engineering which was a degree i got which is the same as the uh liberal arts degree but you have a little bit extra engineering background as opposed to uh, like a foreign language, uh, you know, more liberal arts type. Focus. Oh, wow. That's wild. Then, so then there was computer engineering software emphasis, which was also in the computer science school. Um, and that was, you have a few more electrical engineering classes than computer science electives. Um, and then computer engineering hardware emphasis, which had even more, like you got into kind of semiconductor design and stuff. So even more electrical and hardware. And that was in the electrical engineering department. But they also had to take programming classes. So And then there was, I guess you could get, the, uh, oh, even the college isn't the electrical engineering college. It was the electrical and computer engineering college. Oh, wow. So Yeah. So maybe I'll, we'll take turns giving our take on the whole okay. thing because I, right. you know i went through this process and it's really difficult for me to decide which to pick you know there's a lot of allure in being an engineer like you know uh it's sort of like cool like if you think you picture engineers as people who like build things make things happen like the space shuttles up there because engineers I, things like that i thought they were train drivers <laughs> okay so, most people don't get that joke and they just look at me funny <laughs> oh man those are siege engineers but anyway so um oh. then there's you know so so that was kind of cool so that kind of made me think i should do computer engineering but then i looked at the course load and i saw at least at ucf computer science was sort of more math heavy and computer and physics and uh, uh yeah math and theory heavy and computer engineering had more like physics and uh uh like uh, like dynamics and statics and those kind of things. So it's sort of more applied. And I was always sort of more interested in the theoretical part. So that's, what's, that's what sort of drove me to choose um, computer science. Um, and then for the master's, I did, uh, then, you, you know, for a master's degree, you have to kind of specialize. So I did graphics. Um, and then for the doctorate, I did machine learning. Show but, off. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but basically the takeaway is, 
Um, what I've learned is that computer science, you know, if you really like more of like the math, the number crunching, if you like sort of like what programming languages are made of, and you know, what constitutes a good language, all the different like automata and things like that, those are the kind of things that you can only get in computer science. Like those are very computer science-y things. You know, as opposed to like learning how to program, which you'll learn in either one, you can be proficient in programming. Yeah, totally. totally. Um, computer engineering has more of the guts. Like, like I noticed that Patrick is much better than I am at like things like, you know, microprocessors and you know, like embedded understanding, like actually what's going on under the hood and like how to set up like circuits and things like that. I mean, I I'd never learned any of that stuff, so. Um, you know, so it really kind of depends on what you're interested in, but neither one is really better than the other. And, and I've been asked this question as well um, that I'll try to answer here too, but, and then we'll kind of move on so we don't bore the people who are uh, long out of college. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, so I think is in my experience at, you know, working in companies and talking to other people, in the end, it doesn't matter so much what your specific degree was. In fact, some schools don't even offer so many choices. They only offer one computer science degree and it's, in engineering or it's not in engineering right. um, and and the emphasis isn't so much about that but as to what electives you take as to what your outside of school interests are as to what you do on your own time as to what kind of job you take as your first job like these kinds of things typically matter more and when you get to a, com a big at least a big company and i i'm sure it probably even applies to small companies as well there's not really a distinction like Jason and I, if we worked at the same company, then you know it, we would have the same title for the most part. If we were at the same level, it wouldn't be different because he's more of a you know high level applications guy, and I'm more of a low level embedded guy. Like we would still typically be the same job function at most places. Yeah, totally, totally. So it doesn't matter as much as do what you're interested in, like do what uh, intrigues you more and what you find more uh, fun to do, because that's how you'll be engaged. That's how you'll get good grades, and that's how you impress a uh, employer. Yeah, I mean, notice neither of us really mentioned like, oh, you know, I went to computer science because it made more money or because I read something on CNN or because, you know. So, yeah, I think to Patrick's point, you should really do what you want. And uh, um, then, you know, you can always, if you do what you want, then the rest sort of comes easy. You know, it's like if you are having fun and you're doing something that you really enjoy, then uh, the rest, everything else will sort of fall into place. Uh, and then we're moving on, but I'll caveat it with one last thing, which is uh, I will say that it does make sense to take practical classes. Um, so a certain amount of things you want to be able to go to your first job and know how to do stuff. So if it's not a requirement, software engineering as like, a, you know, the process of doing that. Um, it is important to take some sort of low level class. So you at least halfway know what's going on when you're debugging stuff. Um, it is important to do, you don't want to do just things that are interesting and fun. You want to do stuff that you think um, will make you easier to hire for a bigger number of potential employers. Yeah, that's fair. I, on some, you you got to weigh those two. You, gotta, you, you can't do too much of one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's definitely true. Yeah, I mean, there's, you definitely have to know how to apply what you're doing. Um, I guess, you know, there's always the avenue of being a professor. <laughs> but even professors nowadays, are writing code, you know, or, or at least like helping out the process. A lot of professors maintain like a source code repository of like their researchers' work, researchers' nice. work, and things like that. So, yeah, definitely you should have some applied background nowadays for sure. Yep. So, anyways, right. let's get to tool, tool of the, of the bye, bye week. week. All right, you up first. All right. So my tool of the bye week is Sublime Text Editor. And uh, basically, um, I've had to write a lot of JavaScript lately, which is um, something I'm completely unfamiliar with. Actually, we did a show on JavaScript, but I'm completely unfamiliar <laughs> with writing in like a team you know, environment. Usually if I do JavaScript, it's by myself. I'm hacking together some crazy like client front end for like I wrote a JavaScript uh, front end for NetHack. Um, but, you know, it's always been just kind of hobby project products. I've never had to write JavaScript for a living. And so for the past couple of weeks, I've had to do JavaScript for a living in a production environment. And uh, I had no real idea sort of what was a good um, IDE for doing JavaScript. And uh, a couple of my coworkers recommended Sublime. And, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty great. Um, might not be the best one out there, but uh, I, it has, like, the kind of things you'd really like. The, you know, syntax highlighting, the color coding and all that stuff. 
Um, one of the cool things, it uh, has a pretty good sense, at least for JavaScript. So you can like click on a function and, and it'll take you to where you implemented it, that kind of stuff. Um, also, it has this cool mode where <clears throat> if you haven't edited a file, it has this like the tab on the far left. So it uses tabs like most IDEs where you have like one tab for each file. Um, but they have one tab, which is like all the files that like you haven't really edited yet. And so like if you want to look through all your files, it won't create a bunch of tabs like Eclipse will, you know, like you can just like left click on all the files in the little explorer and go through them all without creating a bunch of tabs. And then if you actually want a file to sort of be sticky to be a tab, you double click on it. Or if you start editing it, then it'll it'll split it out. Um, but overall, the interface is really slick. And, yeah, uh, I've tried it out too, and I like yeah. the. There's a little map down the right that shows you kind of like a high level view of your code. So a lot of times you're trying to move really fast from like the top to the bottom of a file, and you kind of know what it looks like. So it's just really right. easy to get there, and that's fun. And it's free to try, but they suggest if you keep using it, you should buy a license. Yeah. So basically, right? yeah. So if you every time you save, there's like a one percent chance you'll get a little nag window that you have to cancel, which like you know I used it for a couple of days before buying it. And uh, I got the nag window maybe like three or four times, so it's not too bad. Um, but you know, I highly recommend buying it. I think it's only like, I think it was like ten bucks or something. I bought no, it. I think it's using... like forty or fifty dollars. Really? Yeah. Oh man. Well, yeah, it's yeah, totally I'm worth now. it. Fifty nine dollars. So that's a little expensive, but if you work somewhere, you know, work should probably pay for that for you. Hopefully. Yeah, um, yeah. If you have an yeah. employer um, and you're you're doing it as part of work, you should definitely you know get it approved or whatever. But. Um, yep. Even if you do it on your own, the nag screen isn't too bad. Um, you know, it's livable and uh, the ID is oh, great. But if you like it, you should support the developers. Yeah, you definitely. Can't, can't all be mooches. <laughs> yeah, if you have the money, uh, you should definitely buy it. Um, or if you're yeah. self-employed and you're using it as part of your job, you should definitely buy it. Yeah. So right. what about your tool of the bye week? Getting off of my extended uh, stay on non-open source uh, things, <laughs> yeah. I'm finally back onto an open source project. Nice. Yay! Um, and this one is a camera application called Luminance HDR, which stands for High Dynamic Range. Or at least that's what it means in camera. I'm not sure. I hope specifically that's what it means in this app. Um, Looks like and it. we have a link in the show notes. And so this is basically, so the idea of a high dynamic range uh, photo in the photography world is that if you take a picture, um, your camera does basically, it tries to guess like how bright the picture should be. So um, it wants the average brightness of the whole image, and this gets a little bit into image processing, but through either mechanical or electrical mean, or electronic programming means, uh, it tries to determine like the average, if you look, think about like a piece of white paper, if that was the only thing on your screen, it kind of tries to make that like the middle of white, like kind of gray, you know, kind of in the middle so that uh, things to the top and bottom don't get washed out. Like that's what it wants to do. So right. if you think about taking a picture with the bright sky in the background, but like I take a picture of Jason in the foreground in the shade, sometimes like how do you do that? Because the problem is you can only show so many bits, so much range um, in your image. And the fact that I can't, sh I can show the dark of Jason in the shade and the bright of the sunlight, that's easy. But I want to both be able to see the details of Jason in the shade and also see that there's clouds in the sky. But yeah, I mean, really, the, sure. the camera I'm, can only do one or the other. It can only show the details on Jason or show the clouds in the sky. I'm sure everyone's had this before where, you know, there's a sun in the background and they try and take a picture of somebody and the person comes out like completely black. Like you just get oh, their yeah, silhouette. Oh, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you try to take a picture of something and the, the sky is all washed out and glowy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so those are the kind of the two options it takes, right? Well, the... The limitation isn't really that the camera can't do either. It's just it can't do them at the same – or can't do both. It just can't do them at the same time. And so what HDR is about is taking the one where the foreground that's – well, it doesn't matter. But the area that's dark uh, and looks good when you take an image just for the dark area and combining that with an image that is just of the bright area but the dark area looks terrible. And you take both of those and kind of smash them together, right? Um, and so what the computer can do is use a – more bits of resolution uh, for that range. So it can, instead of using an 8-bit number to represent the amount of blue in the image, it can use a 16-bit number to represent the amount of blue. But your screen can't display that, and your eye can actually do a better job, but if the screen can't display it, it, it doesn't matter. And so what it does is use various algorithms 
to try to show both at the same time. So kind of like, I don't care about the middle. So squeeze in the bottom and squeeze in the top and kind of ditch the middle. Yep. Um, or just other things by combining those two images. But the problem is when you take two images, you don't take them in exactly the same way if you're hand holding it. They move slightly. So you also have to shift the images so they are exactly the same on top of each other. Or you get all sorts of bad things happen. Yep, so, that's called registering the images. That's right. And when you have things that are misaligned, you get ghosting. So if, like, if, if a person is walking across the scene, you get ghosting. Um, right. Okay, but long story short, this software does that. Nice. Uh, and it does it in a way with like many, many different options, all sorts of different algorithms, all sorts of thresholds. The user interface uh, leaves something to be desired. It's not always obvious what you should do. And there are pay packages that do a really professional job of this. Um, and once you know what an HDR image looks like, a really famous person is Trey Ratcliffe. He's an online personality and he takes a lot of HDR images using very expensive, very nice software. But if you want to try it out yourself by you know kind of doing this example thing, you're, this is a great way to do it with the software. And it really teaches you a lot about how it is actually being done as opposed to just doing it all for you, which is bad and good. <laughs> yeah, it's totally awesome. I mean, the great thing about this is that, as you said, it's free and open source. So, you know, there's nothing stopping someone from giving this a shot and learning something. Yeah. So I would encourage you to, if you're into photography or even if you're not and just interested in image processing, check it out. Yeah, totally. Okay, so let's go into the programming language. Uh, we've sort of ranted for a while, so we'll try to be <laughs> yeah, a little, long. <laughs> little terse. But uh, we're going to talk about IDLs, which is something, interface description languages, which is something I'm really excited about. Um, I've only been using IDLs for like a little over a year now, um, but it's really helped my productivity tremendously to the point now where I use it um, no matter, even for personal projects, hobbies. I just I'm, I almost start with the with the IDL programming first and then get into you know, the rest of the, the rest of what I'm doing. So, 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 so okay. from a software engineering standpoint, I mean, interfaces, you kind of alluded to it, starting with it. It's not so much the I interface description language. We'll just say IDL from now on. The mm -hmm. IDL is the fact that it's the interface. The interface is the thing that glues all the parts of your project together. If you're using a library, how you interface with that library is very key. If you're going to interface to somebody else, that's like, if you define those interfaces first, everything else somewhat falls into place. Right. And if you think about, you know, if you, you know, although it says interface description language, this is sort of, it's sort of more general than that. It's also, a lot of these are also sort of data description languages. And many programs that we write nowadays are sort of data driven. Um, you know, the algorithms and the processes aren't necessarily new or interesting or difficult, but it's just the data. So. You know, for example, like Instagram or something like that. You know, picture taking had been around forever, but the way that they manipulate the data with the social network and sharing with your friends and things like that is, well, one of the things that makes that product great. But um, there's also many other things, so that's kind of a tangent. But, um, you know, starting with the IDL lets you sort of lay out a framework for sort of how your program is going to flow, not only in terms of processes, and interfaces, but in terms of the data and what's going to be stored and how. That's a good point. And, and we should point out here, people might be saying, well, why do I need a language for that? And if you're only working on one process on one computer, you might be right. But these days, like Jason alluded to, even simple applications need to talk to another application or need to talk to another process or go over the network. And when you do that, you need a way to tell the person on the other end who may be running on a different kind of computer, a different operating system, a different comp a different language, and you need a way to tell them what your data looks like. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or even if you're talking to disk, you know, if you want to save data to the hard drive, you don't and really want to have yeah, serialize it or marshal it. You don't want to have to do that by hand. You know, you want something that is going to generate that for you. So, yeah, IDLs, how did they start? Yeah, so I mean, there's some uh, classic ones that you hear a lot about CORBA, Common Object Relate. Oh, I'm messing it up. Uh, uh, common Object Request Broker Architecture. <laughs> this is a this is a classic one that's been around for a while. You hear a lot about yeah. another one that people might be familiar with if you program on Windows is uh, the Common Object Model that Microsoft uses COM for a lot of communicating with its APIs and stuff, and it's a a way to describe how that data should be and what it looks like. Yeah, totally. So another one is ICE, 
That's made by the Zero G. Um, ice is very similar to Corba. It came out around the same time under the mantra of like, we're not as complicated as Corba, um, but it, it does functionally the same thing. So what are some of the ones that we may have heard of more recently? Yeah, so um, so that was the beginning, was Corba and ice, things like that. Then they moved on to sort of the early web era. There was uh, SOAP and JSON RPC. So basically the way these two work is, <clears throat> You know, at the time, you know, there was an XML and a, and a JSON reader and writer in most modern languages. So they said that this sort of could be an intermediary. So since, you know, Python can write XML and C++ can read XML, you know, we just, we should create some data format. So you could think of like a simple way to do something like SOAP is let's just have an XML file. And if you have like a class, like a C++ class or a Python class, you just have a tag called class and uh, attribute called name with the class name. And then inside of class, you could have many XML tags for all of the members of the class. And the tag could say, you know, uh, you know, member would be the tag name. And then the type, there would be a type attribute saying whether it's like a double or a float or an integer or a character. Uh, and then inside of the member tag, you could actually put the data. So you could actually hold class instances as well as the definitions. Um, so that's one way to do to do uh, SOAP. Uh, uh, SOAP is one implementation of that. So for example, a C++ program can write out some classes uh, using this XML format. And then a Python program can read this XML and then reinterpret it as Python classes. Yeah, so, so maybe an example, I think we're getting a little bogged down in uh, acronym phobia, or acronym, uh, too many acronyms flying around. <laughs> yeah. so, so like, let's say Jason runs a service that uh, shares pictures with the world, or my friends. And I am an application that runs on somebody's computer that wants to upload pictures to Jason. So an RPC is a remote procedure call. Basically, it's saying, like, I want to be able to um, initially take a picture that's on my hard drive and send information about, like, what the who the user is when the picture was taken the picture itself like that data i want to send to jason's web service so that he can then you know show it to the rest of the world um so like how i call a function on his computer to say oh here i want you to upload picture and here's the data that's kind of the process that this stuff describes and then also the reverse like later i might want to pull down that image so i might want to make a call and say hey give me image number one and then have it give it to me or give me a list of all the images yeah, totally. And so then now more modern IDLs uh, are sophisticated enough to where they'll actually generate the code for you for many different languages. So one of them is uh, protocol buffers. And so what you can actually do, protocol buffers comes with a compiler. So you write your proto file and the proto file will say, oh, I have a message, uh, you know, uh, picture, right? And picture has a string called name. And then it also has a, you know, a list of bytes called data, right? <clears throat> now you can run the C++ proto generator and it'll generate a bunch of C++ code that can read and write these picture messages. Yeah, class. It'll generate a whole class with gets and sets for you. Right, so it'll have a get data, set data. It'll have a constructor where you could construct new pictures. Um, and then you can also generate Java code. You can generate JavaScript code. You can generate et cetera, et cetera. In addition to the generator that generates this code, uh, the protocol buffers also comes with um, a way to uh, serialize. So for example, a way to convert it to like a binary representation. So there might be some code for each language, like some C++ code, some Java code, which will say, hey, take this message which you know is a class as Patrick mentioned and turn it into a set of bytes that can go into like a text file or go across the wire. Um, and then also it says, here's a set of bytes that I created or that someone else created using protocol buffers, turn it into the class. Yeah, and kind of in that step too, which is a big gotcha of doing this on your own is validating that what you got is actually a real class or is the thing that you meant it to be. Right, right. And also handling, you know, if the protocol uh, definition, if the proto changes, you know, dealing with that 
um, is also like brings a whole host of problems that you don't want to have to solve on your own. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, if you've ever, you know, written a class and then written all these getters and setters and thought to yourself, like, there should be a way to do this automatically. Well, you know, that's exactly what, you know, these type of modern IDLs do is if you separate, as long as you can separate the logic from the data, then you can do this and not really have to ever write getters or setters or serialization or any of that. It's all just done for you. And so most modern programming nowadays, you have these sort of container classes that just have a lot of data but can't actually do anything that are just auto-generated from some small proto file or thrift file, which we'll get into later. Um, and then, you know, you have a set of handler classes that don't have any data or just have like a small amount of data, but just manipulate these bigger container classes and send them across the wire, write them to a database, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another modern IDL and my personal favorite is Apache Thrift. So actually this was um, started from the people who made protocol buffers. And you can think of this as sort of like a version two of proto buffers. Um, but basically Thrift adds support for things like lists and sets and maps. The kind of things that you know people who have done Java or Python who are familiar with lists or dictionaries in Python. Um, Apache Thrift has native support for that. So in Thrift, for example, you can say, um, like I have this Thrift message and the message is gallery. <clears throat> and my gallery has, uh, let's say a name, which is you know, the name of the gallery. Uh, maybe an integer, which is the ID for, for you know looking it up later. And then the third could be a map, which maps strings to, to picture objects. And so you can map like the name of a picture to the actual data. And all this is done in Thrift using just a few lines of this Thrift code. And then you can auto-generate that you know, class in any language you want. I think there's like 15 languages that are supported. So, so oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of choices here. Um, it's one of those things when you, I don't remember ever really talking about most of these in school. It's kind of something you learn when you get out in the real world and you start running across these recurring problems of, man, I really need to talk to something else and I need to come up with a common way to represent it and uh, I, I'm going to roll my own. And then you run into a whole bunch of problems. So it's yeah. much better to use one of these. Yeah, I mean, just to put it in perspective, ones. so one thing that I did sort of early on in my career is uh, we, uh, we wanted to write a bunch of um, logging data of sort of like what the state of the system was at different points in time. And we actually, we had a bunch of classes in C++ <clears throat> that we, we wrote just by using what's called a memcopy or fwrite. So we actually just took the class in binary form and just wrote it to the hard drive um, as ones and zeros. And then on the other end, to read the class, we actually, uh, you know, we had this file that had a bunch of classes in it. So you think, oh, well, I'll just write some program that just, you know, goes the other way and does an F read. Ah, but the problem is one machine was big Indian and the other machine was little Indian. And for people who don't know, Indian means, uh, it's, it's kind of like a pun. It's Endian. It's actually spelled E-N-D-I-A-N. And basically what it means is, let's say you have um, a short. So a short is a 16-bit number, right? It's a two-byte number. So the question is, where should the number start? Like, if you're writing a number in English, like let's say you're writing the number 1,000. Well, the number, the the most significant part of the number is on the left. Like the one in 1,000. The biggest is in, part. Yeah, is in the thousands digit. Or if you have the number like 222, the first two is the most significant. Like that has the 200, the, the big part of the number. If you lost the first two, that would be a big deal. If you lost the last two, it wouldn't really matter. You'd have 220, let's say. Um, so that in, in the case of computers, there are some computers which are big Indian, and that is where the first byte of a number, say you have a short, that's two bytes, the first byte has the most significant bits in it. And the second byte has the smaller, the least significant bits. Um, some computers are little Indian, which means it's the other way around. So the first byte has the least significant bits, or the numbers that wouldn't really matter if they weren't there, 
or if they were set to zero. So um, the computer that was reading the data was Little Indian, and the computer that was writing it was Big Indian. So all of the numbers were just completely bogus. Like all of them were, like the bits were reversed. So so the numbers were, the bytes were reversed. So the numbers are just garbage. Um, so we had to write all of this code. It was just thousands of lines of code to like byte swap all of these, um, you know, classes and byte swap all of the members in the classes. And it just, it took weeks. And if we had known about, you know, Apache Thrift or protocol buffers, we would have saved literally weeks, probably months of work. Yeah, definitely very useful. Yeah, I mean, there are just tons and tons of gotchas when it comes to moving, you know, turning code into data or turning, you know, the the data that lives inside a code into ones and zeros, serialization and marshalling. And there's just tons and tons that goes into that. And so, you know, it's interesting to learn about, but if you just want to write something to disk, uh, save yourself the trouble and use Apache Thrift. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So so IDLs kind of are this is different, you know, as opposed to talking to one specific language, you're talking kind of, kind of about a group of languages, but they do share some common features. And and some of his idea of this this common idea of like the message, the thing that you might want to send or write to disk and generating these, you know, uh all this ancillary helper code that needs to be done and and it's really nice that most of these provide utilities or are part of it where they process these message description files and generate code for you. Yeah, totally. Um, the messages are huge. Another big part of it is most IDLs support many different protocols. So, for example, uh, Apache Thrift uh, supports JSON. So you can send it across over the wire as a JSON object. And that's really useful for web debugging because you know a lot of web technology is sort of designed to expect JSON. Um, it can also send data as binary. So if you want to write the data to a file on a on your hard drive that you don't really care uh, it to be human readable, you could do binary. Or if you want to store it in a database, um, you can use binary. Um, also, many of these have what's called a compact binary. And this is where they do a lot of sort of processor intensive work to shrink the size down. So um, this can actually have a dramatic effect. So for example, you know, you might reduce your database size by two thirds by using a compact encoding, um, which, you know, if you're dealing with gigs and gigs of data, and if you're using something like Amazon Elastic Cloud or something, this could save you a ton of money. Yeah. Um, the nice thing is also that they, each library kind of typically has code to handle the details of what it's going out as. So if you if you're serializing it, like Jason said, in one endian and then reading it back in another, uh, the protocol will actually have defined what that is. And so the readers and writers on both sides all have agreed on what that should be and what to expect. So you don't have to worry about it. That's right. So just for example, and I don't know if this is actually how it works, but you know, the Apache Thrift might say, hey, if you're big Indian, then I'll byte swap everything before I send it out. Like everything will be in little Indian when it's in between computers or on disk. And that way it's sort of everyone has the same expectation, you know, and you don't have any crazy data. Yeah. So the, I mean, some of the good, good moving on to strength, some of the good yeah. things about these are these, we talked about the automatic code generation, the ability to use whatever language you want, whatever kind of computer you want, whatever kind of operating system you want, go across the internet. Those are really the, and the time saving. I mean, these are all really good strengths of the ideas, but what are some of the weaknesses? Yeah, so there is you know, a certain amount of engineering work that you have to spend. I mean, for one thing, you have to learn this technology and everyone using it has to be aware of it. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's just like using compilers, just like using everything. It's not going to be as efficient as if you did it by hand, you know? I mean, this has been the argument since the beginning of time, right? Like, oh, if I wrote assembly by hand, it would be so much better. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there are cases, like especially, you know, let's say you want some real-time sensitive, like you're writing uh, uh, some plugin to do video conferencing or something like that. You probably want to write your own serialization that, that um, takes advantage of certain nuances of your environment. So let's say you're doing uh, sending video, like compressing video. You probably don't want to use... Apache <laughs> Thrift to compress video because video has certain characteristics like the human eye cannot really distinguish shades of blue 
and you want to take advantage of that. You want to compress blue more than everything else. Uh, these are the kind of things that, like you don't want to use uh, an IDL for. Yep. And also, I mean, if you're not careful, or like Jason said, if there's potential things that you know more about than the general solution, it, it can take longer. If, if you were going to write a very custom binary format, you might be able to make it smaller than what any of these things are able to do. So there, there might be overhead there that's associated with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So um, some good tools for uh, doing IDLs. Um, I use Thrift for Eclipse. So basically it's, it does like syntax highlighting and things like that. Um, I think it can actually run the Thrift code generator for you. So when you make changes to the Thrift file, it will um, auto-generate the code. Um, for me, it's easier just to, you know, to run the command that generates the code. It's not that much work. But I think you can, you can with some elbow grease, you can set it up to be sort of more streamlined. Uh, another one is for protocol buffers is protoclips. And that's very similar, but, uh, but for that format. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, very useful, very flexible. If you want to talk across the web, do remote procedure calling, if you want to serialize data to disk, if you want to just store something. Also, some databases, you know, have this language and are able to do kind of more intelligent things if they know in advance, like what, like the description of what your data is stored as. Um, yeah, th these are really powerful things, something that not everybody knows about. They're not completely obvious, but when you learn about them, they're a great, great help. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever seen something that was sort of transformed to the web, like I saw recently, like SSH on the web or something like that, or, or you see these like video games, like FreeSib, they ported it to the web, and you figure like, how is that possible? Like, like did they rewrite all of this in JavaScript? You know, like, like how is this running in my browser? Well, chances are the browser, the JavaScript is just some thin client, and it's using something like uh, Thrift or, or or protocol buffers to talk to some you know bigger program on the server that's running in C++ or Java or whatever. Yep. Well, I, I wanted to point out, um, and, and, well, finishing up with IDLs, um, we have a lot of great user feedback. We um, user feedback, uh, listener feedback. Um, <laughs> so we've had a great amount of reviews on iTunes. Thank you guys for those. We've had some good feedback on our Google Plus page. Um, people have given us a lot of show topic ideas that they want to hear about, things they want to talk about, encouragements, some uh, helpful things to watch out for in the future, what people like hearing, what they don't like hearing. So yep. we're really appreciative of all that. It's glad to know you guys are out there and there's other people on the other end of these microphones. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we have um, added like all of the you know requests to, the, um, to our list of programming languages to cover. Um, we, we want to sort of like cover sort of a variety of languages and sort of mix it up between the common ones and some of the more uncommon. Um, but we definitely have taken all the feedback and we're definitely going to keep uh, covering languages until we've gotten every request out the door. So definitely <laughs> keep, definitely keep, and, and beyond. So definitely uh -oh. keep, uh, keep sending us your feedback. We really appreciate it. If you have any particular show topics that you want to cover, like if you're really interested in, uh, like you know embedded stuff and you want Patrick to give like a little tutorial on how to make like an RC car or something or if you're interested in like games or AI or whatever I mean if you have any requests or any special topics you want to hear definitely shoot us a shoot us a, a, a post on the G plus um, and uh, we, we'd be happy to respond to that all right well that's a wrap thank you very much cool see you guys later the intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.